Good afternoon. I'm Claire Brindis, and I'm the director of the Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies at the University of California, San Francisco. And I am really delighted to introduce to you our speaker today, who's really a Renaissance man. Um, he recently finished his tenure as the chairman and CEO of Kaiser Permanente, and now is the chairman and CEO of an institute on intergroup relationships. Previously, he served as the chairman and CEO of Health Partners in Minnesota. So we're very, very fortunate that a health policy leader uh, is joining us today. So welcome, George, to this uh, brief interview with you. Well, thank you for inviting me. Very happy to have you here. So you've written now seven books on a variety of really hot topics in the area of health policy. You've written about health economics, uh, the way that our system has been having a number of problems. You've talked about the a variety of, of ways that we can perhaps deal with this issue. But, be, but perhaps for our audience, it might be helpful to sort of step back and think about a 30,000 foot view and think about what have been sort of the strands? Why are we here now? Why are we in such deep trouble with our American health care system? I think we're in such deep trouble because too much of the system is focused on the cash flow of healthcare, and it's not patient focused. We haven't really built the system around the patient. We haven't built the care delivery infrastructure around the patient. We clearly haven't built the data flow around the patient. We've had paper medical records. We've had separate siloed information um, that really doesn't allow for best care. And so what we haven't done is we haven't been able to really deliver the best care to patients based on the ability to have all of the information about the patients at the point of care. And the fee-based system we use is very, very perversely designed. Because we buy care only by the piece, mm -hmm. that incents volume, which everybody understands. But an even bigger problem is that disincents re-engineering. If you try to re-engineer care to make it better, if you do process engineering, and you, you know, take a patient flow where the patient has three scans and you cut that back to one scan used three times, mm -hmm. that won't happen because um, three revenue uh, opportunities will be lost and people want to bill for all three scans and we need it. Same thing is true with asthma care. We, we end up with patients having asthma attacks that they shouldn't have and the current system pays a lot of money for the asthma attacks and even more money if the asthma attack ends up in hospitalization mm -hmm. and doesn't pay for the uh, prevention that's needed to keep those asthma attacks from happening. And 75% of asthma attacks don't need to happen. So that, that's the cash flow of care. So when you buy care by the piece, it actually disincents care reengineering and it also rewards bad care, rewards care outcomes, and it richly rewards care screw ups. Mm -hmm. So if a patient has an infection, 1.7 million Americans went to hospitals last year and got an infection they didn't have the day they went to the hospital. No. That's 1.7 million. Most of those could have been prevented and most of them, except for the ones paid by Medicare, most of them are actually very profitable. Mm -hmm. That's a really perverse system. We, we need to do a much better job of buying care. We need to buy care in a way that encourages better outcomes, better results, and the reward safety and the best outcomes. And because we have purchased care badly, we have major problems with care. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much for that summary, uh, given the complexities of what we're trying to solve here. Um, so you've mentioned the electronic medical record. You've talked about uh, trying to find a way to eliminate some of these perverse incentives that are mm -hmm. built into the system. Now with the implementation of health care reform, are there aspects of that reform that's cl clearly a controversial um, bill and a very complex piece of legislation? But have you seen anything within the, the Obamacare and the, in terms of the DNA of Obamacare that gives you some hope for the future? Well, the insurance part has, has been a little problematic. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we need the insurance part. We need to cover everyone. We're the only industrialized country that doesn't cover its entire population, and so we're, we're overdue. But when you look at the total bill, 72% of the bill is actually based on care improvement. 
So there's information that are now requiring hospitals to report their infection rates that didn't exist before. Mm -hmm. There's information about connectivity, data connectivity that wasn't there before. There's all kinds of information about patient-focused care. Countable care organizations are featured and encouraged by the bill. So uh, if the bill is implemented well, we'll have an increasing number of care sites that are functioning as accountable, care-based, in delivering organized care, mm -hmm. and the parts of the bill that deal with medical homes I think are really very directionally correct. So having patients have a medical home where they can have caregivers who have their information and who can work as a team mm -hmm. on their behalf is really good. So the bill has some very, very good care delivery elements and they never ever get discussed. Right. When you talk about the bill, people act like the bill is entirely about the insurance pieces of the bill and the insurance pieces are actually less than a third of the bill when mm -hmm. you actually count up the number of provisions mm -hmm. of the bill. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a small part of the bill, it's a very visible part. Mm -hmm. And even on that part of the bill, the insurance parts of the bill only relate to the 7% of the American population that's in the individual market. Mm -hmm. So 93% of the American population who get insured are insured by groups or by government programs. And it's only a very small subset that's in the in the exchanges. So we really have kind of the tail wagging the dog in terms of the perception of that mm -hmm. entire uh, legislative agenda. Right. I want to switch a little bit now to the fact that you've also been someone who's very, very deeply committed to the development of children zero to five. And in your latest book on the American healthcare system and the economics of the system, you spent quite a bit of time talking about how if we made the right kinds of investments in children at that very important developmental stage, that could impact yeah. our health care costs, particularly in the Medicaid program, but probably many other types of costs. And I, I, I ask you that question because I really was struck by, this is the aspect of you that I think is very much of an, a renaissance man, thinking mm -hmm. so broadly and thinking so holistically and comprehensively about the up you know, take of, um, not the uptake only, but the mm -hmm. upstream costs to our system. So could you speak a little bit about that? Uh, it's, a, it's a major issue that, that people really don't understand, and it's something we need to address. When, when you look at uh, the American health care, or when you look at America, the best predictor for who's going to end up in prison at age 18 is the number of words in the vocabulary in kindergarten. It's actually the children with very small vocabularies end up not able to read, they end up falling, flunking out of school, leaving school, and they end up in prison. And, and those children are 40% more likely to get pregnant, they're 60% more likely to drop out of school, and they are nearly 80% more likely to go to prison. And when you look at people who are in prison, 70% of the people in prison either read badly or can't read at all. Mm -hmm. And you can predict by age three who is not going to be able to read. Those first three years of life are critically important. The brain develops in those first three years. If the brain is exercised in those first three years, it's pure biology. If the brain is exercised in those first three years, the kids end up with a strong brain and they do well. And if the brain isn't exercised, the brain actually shrinks. You actually end up with mm -hmm. a smaller, weaker brain. And if you read to children, talk to children, sing to children in those years and exercise the brain, they're much better off. And those children are much more likely to get pregnant when they're in high school, much more likely to get pregnant. Mm -hmm. And they have much higher health risk. And one of the things that people don't know is that the, the children who drop out of school actually have 10 years shorter life because their, their health is so bad. Mm -hmm. And right now in this country, 51% of the births are paid for by Medicaid. Okay. So that makes this a Medicaid issue. We really need to deal with this from the Medicaid agenda. And if we do that, we'll have fewer teen pregnancies, we'll have fewer kids with asthma, we'll have better, healthier kids. And so it's something that we need to address and we need to address now. So, um, George, you've really been very instrumental in sharing with us what are contributing factors to the state of the state of our healthcare system. And I would love some of your thoughts on how are we going to control some of our runaway costs? Are there any particular strategies that you think will be very effective in changing 
this perverse incentive so that we can get a better handle on this huge part of our American budget. Well, we really need to change the way we buy care so that we buy care by the package and that we need caregivers organized around the patient. We need the data flow organized around the patient. We need the caregivers organized around the patient. And when that happens, the medical science that we have available to us now is so good that we can cut the number of people who go blind from diabetes in half. We can cut the number of kidney failures in half. We can actually cut strokes in half. Kaiser Permanente, we actually cut the number of strokes in half mm -hmm. by going upstream in the process, identifying the people who were at high risk of stroke and intervening with those patients individually to the point where we now have much better stroke outcomes. The whole country needs to do that. Mm -hmm. The whole country needs to go down those paths. And to do that, the whole country needs the data. And there's no reason not to have the data. All healthcare sites can be computerized and the data can be used and as a public policy agenda, we need to insist that that happens. And with this public agenda, do you see that, you know, currently, obviously, a number of large entities are making a substantial profit on the yes. state of the state. So <coughs> engaging the, that sector in sort of changing where this big ocean liner is going, what would be the incentives for them to come to the table? How do, how do we incentivize this sector that has traditionally made so much more out of our poor, uh, poorly motivated system. Yeah, this will not happen um, voluntarily. The, one of my books is called Healthcare Will Not Reform Itself. Mm. And, and the point that I make in, in the most current book, Ian, in that one, is that someone who's upstream in the flow of cash has to change the way we buy care. And there's only four parties upstream in the flow of cash. There's the patient, and that's a relatively small amount. There is the uh, employer, mm -hmm. there are the health plans, and there are the government programs. And most of the money comes from the health plans, government programs. So we need the health plans and the government programs to buy care differently, and we need them to buy care based on the outcomes of care and on the total package of care. And when that happens, all the caregivers will follow. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't happen, the caregivers will keep doing exactly what they're doing because they're generating $2.7 trillion in revenue, and that's a lot of money, and that amount of money is very seductive, and it's addictive. Mm -hmm. And so it's not going to change voluntarily. So as the book said, healthcare will not reform itself, but the buyers, uh, people upstream in the flow of cash, can change the way they buy care, and care will follow very quickly. Mm -hmm. Follow the money. We'll follow the money. Mm -hmm. Care will follow the money. Right. And hopefully improve the outcomes of our country, when, yeah. especially when we compare ourselves internationally to so many other, yes. you know, on so many of the dimensions and on so many of the outcomes. We spend three times as much on care as the, as the other countries. We get slower admission to the, the hospital. We get less hospital use than, uh, than any of the Western countries. That's also in the book. Mm -hmm. We have uh, less access to primary care. If you look at our access to primary care, is way below all of the European mm -hmm. countries. They have, we have slower access to specialty care than some of them. You know, we, have, we actually get less care in this country, and we pay more for it in total because we're getting the wrong care, and we're paying the wrong price for it. Mm -hmm. And we should not be surprised when we get the wrong outcomes. And we shouldn't be surprised when we get the wrong outcomes mm -hmm. because the care delivery system isn't built around the patient. It's built around the incident. Mm -hmm. And that's the wrong, wrong model. How do we create an alliance or an alignment between these different sectors so that you have the health sector, yeah. the education sector, the juvenile justice sector, and the prison sector, as well as politicians? Because the data that you've shared with us is clearly evidence-based. There's enough information. We sh should be reaching a critical yes. tipping point. We should be. So are there some thoughts that you have about what will it take for us to move forward on this agenda? I, I think one of the first things that it will take to move forward is a really clear understanding on the part of the, the politicians and the parents of what these opportunities are and what the problems are. Because right now, the overwhelming majority of people who we need to understand this issue do not understand it. Mm -hmm. They don't know it. They don't understand how important those first three years are. Mm -hmm. And so people are dealing with issues of pre-kindergarten or they're trying to figure out how to cut the dropout rate of people already in school, even though they're, 
their destiny is already uh, fixed by the fact that they're unprepared they can't be ready for school and so we, I think what we need to do is we need to have everyone understand this and I really believe that when people do understand it people are going to make smarter decisions mm -hmm. well on that optimistic note um, I really, really appreciate the time you've spent with us, and thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed it.